I want to um, welcome you all to this um, uh, session. Uh, these sessions are getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> Alice and I were, were trying to uh, figure out the theory behind this. So, uh, so this uh, session is about opportunities and challenges in regional research partnerships. And um, I had an opportunity to sit at um, lunch with our uh, uh, panelists, and I confess to them that I know very, very little about the subject. So I, um, I'm uh, both uh, 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 honored and humbled um, by these uh, distinguished um, uh, uh, set of panelists. So first let me introduce the members of the panels. Oh, my name is Ahmed al Magarmid, and I am a computer scientist. I work here in the Qatar Foundation. Um, the um, first panelist, uh, there is a second um, person here, is uh, Dr. Zakari Abdul Hamid, and uh, he is the science advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia. And he and I had a wonderful time. Uh, over lunch talking about uh, my first time in Malaysia in the island of Langkawi. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. And um, uh, our um, uh, second panelist uh, is a person that needs no introductions uh, here in the Qatar Foundation and in the uh, biomedical and the healthcare uh, arena. Uh, Sir, uh, Dr. Sir Mejdi Yaqub is the co-chairman of the Qatar Heart Research Center and he will tell you about some of the wonderful things that he is doing here in Egypt and uh, all over the world. And we have, um, uh, we're lucky to have uh, um, um, two of our uh, colleagues from the uh, Sultanate of Oman, uh, uh, from the Research Council, Dr. Zahra Rawahi, and she's a computer scientist, so she and I have uh, uh, kinship here and Dr. Ahmed Khalifa Shikaili, and we, we have two-thirds of our names are matching. So I'm always finding the symmetries, you know, so, so they're both with the Research Council, and um, the way we're going to do this is uh, we're going to keep it very informal. Um, um, <clears throat> what, what we're going to do is uh, first um, give everybody a chance to make an opening remark, very, very short, in like a one minute maximum. And then uh, I have a set of questions that I will ask. Our ambition is to be done in about half an hour and then open it for discussion. Uh, we want this to be as informal and as, as uh, uh, interactive as possible. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sit down and um, and then when we get to this next set of questions, I'll flip the chart. So, um, the, so the first question that I wanted to um, I wanted to uh, ask of Dr. Uh, Zekri is uh, 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 is first to uh, well, well, let's first make the, the opening remarks from end to end, and then I'll put the questions. Dr. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it, but it works. It's high tech. Uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity maybe to thank the organizers of the committee of uh, this gathering and the Qatar Foundation for inviting us and for organizing this event that for all of us will be together discuss important issues related to the central globalization. And I think from the message of Her Highness, and I, want, I just want to express my thanks to Her Highness uh, for, for all her efforts in, I mean, uh, in promoting research and innovation within this region. And actually I am praying uh, daily for all other Arab nations to follow her steps and follow other uh, ways of uh, I mean, putting science and technology in one of the important uh, issues uh, and to give it the resources such as uh, the fund. Uh, I'm very keen that I'm here with you. Uh, to 
I don't have much, I mean, uh, much experience in collaboration or partnership. And uh, I saw today in the talk in the morning, they really gave us uh, a real good example of partnership between different organizations within, uh, within Qatar, between universities, as well with the companies, with the, with the other organizations, as well with the international bodies. The thing that I, I miss it here, the, the, the regional collaboration at the state here, yeah, between the GCC countries, between the Arab world, where it is, we cannot see it. I mean, there's no a paper talking about this issue, actually. And it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really missing us. Uh, so we need to pay more attention. And even the people, uh, I mean, a few months ago, I was in Saudi Arabia. They had a higher education and research conference. Uh, it was a very good gathering with a lot of researchers, a lot of female uh, uh, doing research. But I cannot see them here. I was expecting actually to meet them here, but very few within the GCC country people. So maybe you will be able to help. Inshallah, we'll get into those questions. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Zaki. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would also like to echo what was just said about uh, this forum and uh, this country and this city. I think it's a very good uh, start really for uh, Qatar to take this advantage of uh, opening up their uh, research forum to almost a global uh, audience. Uh, it's true that what we are trying to discuss here is uh, original research uh, partnership, but uh, I think uh, we have to take it into context. Uh, being uh, a very flattened earth today, uh, we should be focusing on local issues, but we must not lose sight of the need to be global. So in that sense, while we are looking over to see what kind of collaboration that we could uh, generate uh, within the GCC and the Islamic countries, we should always be mindful that uh, the connectivity that we have today, uh, we should be encouraging a global kind of, of uh, partnership. So it, it is in that context that uh, I'd like uh, to start uh, my remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I too am uh, delighted to be here this afternoon. Um, obviously, I am part of the scene here because uh, um, I had, like you said, uh, UCRC, Tata Body Vascular Research Center. I'm deeply aware of the need uh, for collaboration within the region and beyond, like we have had, uh, for many reasons. Um, I think the obvious one is uh, uh, research and development plus science, science in general, uh, is, uh, it, in my mind, and is now being shown repeatedly to be the only way to prosperity and development of communities. Uh, I, for one, am involved with uh, healthcare delivery, tertiary care, being a heart surgeon, but also being involved with uh, research uh, I can be at college and uh, different parts of the world. And the third arm is uh, the Chain of Hope, uh, which is a charity I work with. And we go all over the world, just come back from Jamaica, where we operate as well as do research. And we do research in Sub-Saharan Africa. But coming back to the region, um, I see incredible opportunities uh, rather than challenges in what way? Um, for example, uh, in Egypt, a neighboring country, a so far, Islamic country as well, 
And there are uh, several things. One, a huge population with uh, a lot of uh, different types of diseases, and the diseases do differ, a lot of genetic background, and importantly, um, a lot of uh, young people, and uh, some of them are highly, I mean highly talented, and uh, just they need to be given opportunity uh, to research and to collaborate. I see the same here uh, with the groups at Hallett Hospital, the colleagues around. So there is a nucleus as well. Uh, I see a massive complementarity. Uh, there is Yemen, not very far. Uh, I've been there and they see uh, neglected diseases such as rheumatic heart disease just ravaging the country with children suffering and so on. Massive opportunities for collaboration. Um, we have started some sort of collaboration between uh, different centers, both in this country, in Aswan and Egypt, and uh, with Imperial College and one of uh, our young uh, graduates, uh, half Egyptian, half uh, Dutch, uh, she obtained her uh, PhD from Imperial College, with most of the work being done in Egypt on a neglected disease, which is uh, very nice. That type of work can be spread. So, I see a lot of opportunities. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation to come to Qatar. I actually, I was in Qatar in 1989. And in that time, I was a student in Qatar University for, about, uh, for one semester only. But uh, since that time, I didn't come to Qatar. This is the second time for me since 1989. And actually, I astonished about the development in Qatar. Although we are neighbors, but I, I didn't expect to, uh, that Qatar to be like this. Although we, we, we know that we, we, um, we see the development in TV and so on. The, so the most uh, astonishing uh, remarks to me is the Qatar Foundation, to be honest with you. Actually, the Qatar Foundation is a big hub, and uh, I think it will benefit not only Qatar itself, but all the whole region, or maybe whole Islamic countries, I can say, or Arab wars. As you know, I think oh, the Arab world does not lack of the talented people, as the Sir Major Hoops uh, mentioned, but maybe in some countries they lack of fun and uh, technology. And by, by, uh, if we have the fun, we have the technology. And uh, by, by establishing uh, establishment of Qatar Foundation, I think this problem will be solved. Uh, this is what I want to say. Thanks, Tom. Um, so, what I'd like to know uh, from Dr. Zikri is if you could give us an example of a successful, maybe an unsuccessful, an example of a collaboration that, 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 that we could maybe uh, start with. Uh, thank you. Uh, before that, maybe I should share with you some uh, problems to us. I think in any of these uh, countries, in particular the Islamic countries, uh, leadership is very important. And uh, you saw it here in uh, Qatar. And that means uh, clear vision or what the country wants to be. Uh, for instance, in my country, there's what we call Vision 2020. That's nine years down the road. We want to graduate from a middle-income country that we are now to a high-income country. And with that, uh, goals were set. And uh, one of the factors there would have a very precise uh, 
uh, science and uh, technology uh, policy and the need to invest in uh, science and technology and uh, R&D. Uh, you will recall in any industrialized countries the percentage of uh, uh, R&D against the GDP is anything between 2.5 to 3.5 percent and we heard that a couple of days ago in Qatar the target was 2.8 percent and uh, maybe more and one of the problems in the Islamic countries on average the level of uh, spending on R&D is less than 1 percent if you got 0.5 percent that's already good uh, this is the problem. Uh, the second thing is uh, the education in each country, in particular uh, the teaching and learning of science and uh, mathematics, or what is also known so, as STEM. Uh, Dr. Zekri, yeah. we in fact will come to some of these hurdles later, uh, right? yeah, in, in just a minute, if we can uh, uh, maybe uh, just take a okay. The idea is, the reason I wanted an example is I just wanted to have us okay. on the same wavelength with the yeah. audience. What, what do we mean by a regional collaboration? Maybe I'll cite you one example. Okay. And you know in the uh, South Asian countries where I come from, uh, that is the uh, mega diverse countries of the world. Uh, three of the uh, biodiverse countries of the world, Indonesia, Philippines and Malaysia, uh, happen to be in that area. So one uh, increasingly successful collaboration is on the biodiversity research. So I think I, you could even extend it to a region like the GCC. There are common challenges that one could collaborate on. Uh, so even that, it has to be predicated by good leadership again and commitment to make that uh, collaboration work. Uh, if you don't have those elements backing you, uh, it won't be uh, sustainable. Thank you. Please. Same line. Uh, I used to be a soprano for Muslim University College of Medicine. And over there we have medical and robotics department. And uh, we managed uh, to do, I mean, uh, uh, to to establish an infrastructure for uh, container medicine. So we managed to, uh, for, for certain diseases, that normally they would like to consult uh, other parties, international parties, such as uh, in India, in, uh, uh, in Berlin, in different parts of the world. So there were real good collaboration and uh, contribution between two organizations to lead, I mean, uh, for the benefit of life over there, for the benefit of the patient, for the benefit of the doctor, to, I mean, to get a uh, second opinion about their diagnosis or the second cases. And we have a number of projects within this line uh, related to the medical applications and how the people from the overseas, they can assist in running the daily practice uh, of medicine, within the college of medicine. Uh, that has hospital work in the college of medicine. And this really presented different uh, conferences. It was really a success, uh, we consider it, for a collaborative success. Uh. So, uh, just, uh, actually, uh, we would like to define the success, no? how, we, uh, how the collaboration is successful. In terms of that, sure, if there is a collaboration for sure, for example, for a project. And at the end of this project, uh, the people, they don't keep that collaboration. Even, in our, we, for example, when I was in uh, Sultan Qabz University in Oman, we have a collaboration with, with, the, with, the, with the many people. But actually, since that project is finished, there's no collaboration anymore. <laughs> so uh, the definition of successful is by sustaining that collaboration and keep that collaboration on for long period, not just for shared period. This is what so, so, um, I maybe, as I, so I changed the slide to the, list of the, to the list of the questions because what you're talking about is actually one of the points that we wanted to come to, that is sustainability of, of collaborations. And, and I believe 
what Dr. Zahra also that, uh, had mentioned, uh, 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 Sir Mejdi, uh, do you have any uh, uh, example that you want to uh, uh, start with before we go to the questions? Uh, there is um, a very successful collaboration in the Gulf region um, with a register for unstable angina and uh, heart attacks and that has been reported quite successfully and it is extending to other regions um, beyond the Gulf. Um, we have just started uh, another study um, between um, Egypt, Italy and uh, Doha in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, inherited heart muscle disease and uh, looking at the different genes um, affecting these individuals and looking after them. And we were told, for example, that um, it's not very common in Egypt. Within the last four years, we had 500 patients on our list and uh, we have uh, defined them and we have uh, uh, sequenced the genes in 200 and that is ongoing doing the same here the collaboration with italy and um, beyond in south africa some of the colleagues there also have a registry so that's a successful beard budding uh, collaboration now, is the um, uh, Aswan uh, uh, Heart uh, Center that you opened a few weeks ago with Her Highness in Egypt, is that going to be clinical for treatment or also research? Um, very much research oriented, um, although uh, it is concerned with humanitarian healthcare delivery, um, one third of the, the resources are allocated, we're working towards that, to research. Uh, and the research uh, goes from uh, basic science, community, and translational research. Uh, and uh, the sequencing of the genes, for example, is very much part of the S1 Center. So th this is the S1 Center, is uh, a new facility that was opened with the support from Qatar Foundation in, in Egypt uh, a few weeks ago. Um, um, so you see in front of you there a set of questions. You can't see them, but you have hard copies. Um, what um, the, 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 the first one is, um, so we tried to tease out some examples, but the fact of the matter is most of us can think of examples of collaborations within the GCC, or within the Arab countries, or within the Muslim countries. Unlike, for example, at NSF, where NSF funds international research, and there's some work going on in between the US and, and Europe, and things of that nature. So, uh, 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 Dr. Zeki had uh, been a, uh, uh, in a position as an advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia, um, and, um, and, and, and had to think of why, why, uh, uh, why is it like that? Why is it that uh, that there's so little research collaborations? Um, I think uh, one reason is because, uh, uh, in some ways, we lack the competence. And it's also by way of history. Uh, before that, just recall the Islamic world from the 7th century to the 17th century, we have our golden age of knowledge, of science. Uh, this is the region from uh, uh, southern Spain in Cordoba right to uh, the edge of China. And during those days, uh, young, budding Western scholars used to uh, travel long distance you know, to learn 
knowledge. And today, uh, like it or not, the Mecca, we must say, pray to Mecca. The Mecca of knowledge and uh, Mecca of science and technology is the West. So we have to accept that fact. And I think there's uh, no reason why we couldn't be uh, reaching out and uh, encourage uh, collaboration with the uh, assistance of uh, friends, uh, peers, colleagues uh, uh, in the West. So again, uh, speaking from my country, we are open on that. While we try and uh, we are in the process of strengthening uh, science and technology in our country, uh, training the young people you know, and uh, providing uh, funds for R&D, promoting science and technology. Uh, we also link up with colleagues in the North. Uh, so that's my, one of my earlier points uh, earlier on, because uh, science is so global. So while we think uh, local, while we act local, we also need to think uh, global. That is the only way, I think, for us uh, uh, to progress. So following on on the same on the same sort of uh, idea uh, uh, of of lack of uh, collaborations, uh, what are the main hurdles to these collaborations, uh, uh, Sir Majdi? Uh, um, um, what, what are the main hurdles uh, uh, in, in in the way of these collaborations? Um, Uh, I think some of them have been already mentioned. Uh, the funding is uh, a major hurdle. Uh, I know for sure uh, that um, the budget for research uh, and development in Egypt has been around 0.4% of the GDP for the last 15 years uh, there was uh, a, a study uh, sponsored by the Royal Society of London the after study and it shows them okay, very clearly 0.4% uh, and continued like that and now it is starting to rise we have that it is 2.63%, about 2.5% anyway. And if you look at the uh, 2.5% of what, you can see also a massive difference. Uh, so funding is um, a big hurdle. Isolation is another. Um, uh, everybody uh, rotates. Um, in their own circle, the universities, I know for sure, and around the region, have gone down and down, and the emphasis uh, was all that some of it is out uh, in the, this document, which I would recommend it would be published by the Royal Society. Uh, and that was uh, supported. Her Highness was pushing in that direction in a big way for the study uh, to come out. So in, I, I can see that the, the universities um, were ignored for a long time. The emphasis was on teaching and even that went down. Research was hardly on the agenda. Uh, the point about lost confidence is definitely there. So funding, uh, isolation, uh, no emphasis on research, and uh, apart from what we see here in Qatar, uh, which is fantastic, um, research was thought of as a luxury. Uh, there were no si there are no systems. I mean, like the funding of research we have had 
uh, about here this morning, uh, the systems for funding research in different countries, and I know more uh, where I come from. Uh, there is no equivalent of the British Medical Research Council where people compete for grants. Uh, there is no system. And uh, the being meritorious and competition, all that. So that has been a massive hurdle. So before you can collaborate, you need to collaborate to my way of uh, thinking from a position of strength. You need to be a scientist and feel I have my own dignity and I can collaborate with my colleague. But if I'm feeling down, I have no fund and I'm isolated, and, uh, how can you collaborate? So we need to, to correct uh, many things. Uh, there are some good examples, but uh, there's a long way to go. In, in, in indeed, I think, I think even um, the model of the university in the uh, Arab, Arab world, let me not go as far as the Islamic world because there are some successful examples in, in, in Turkey and maybe in Indonesia or Malaysia. But in the Arabic world, the, the whole model of a university is outdated. So we think of the universities in the Arab world are places that you go to and get a degree. Um, and I believe this is, I, I agree completely with, with, with what you were saying. Um, look at the examples of the successes when people go abroad, Arabs go abroad, and what they can achieve versus if they would have stayed uh, home. The example this morning, the two of chiefs of research at the top five pharmaceuticals are um, uh, Arabs. And, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, 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 so the idea that the university is a teaching ground and, and has nothing to do with research is, is antiquated uh, in, 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 in fact. So I would, I would add even more gloomier uh, uh, picture to say that uh, the Arabs succeed despite of our universities, not because of our universities. Um, um, so I, I want to um, uh, ask uh, Zahra, uh, so she's a computer s scientist like myself, and, and I, 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 I want you to, to, to be a little bit more specific. What is the role that computing infrastructure could play in overcoming some of these hurdles? of collaboration? Yes. Uh, the, the, I mean, uh, wide band uh, in the infrastructure, it could really help to decrease the proximity, the spaces, the distance, so we can collaborate online. But the attitude of the people, the, I mean, the attitude of the Arab community, we tried with the e-learning. We was teaching courses, online courses. We tried to develop very interactive uh, and adaptive online systems and to give it to the student. The student, they don't prefer it at all. They prefer face-to-face -face interaction. So if the same model, I don't think, I think even the researchers, they are very busy. They prefer to communicate with people. I mean, uh, they don't prefer just to be online communicating within the virtual environment. Even though there are a huge number of tools, such as um, sh social networking uh, environments, we can create a certain community of practice within certain areas. The tools are available. The mechanisms are available. But maybe the awareness of the individuals to, I mean, to utilize these tools as a media for collaboration and as a way of collaboration. But I think at the start, they need a physical, way, physical type of collaboration. They need to meet. They need to, ha to have such a similar to this gathering, even with a smaller scale small groups, interest group within certain area to, I mean, to nourish that one, the, to start the, the ideas of uh, working within certain areas uh, to define the outcomes that they want to reach it. And then later on, they can u utilize uh, the infrastructure, uh, the network of infrastructure to complete their tasks. Do you imagine 
anything more sophisticated than just sort of the raw infrastructure like the raw broadband, things like open science or, or other uh, portals that, that make easier collaboration, makes easier access to resources, to journals, to Most open research results. Mm -hmm. Most of these tools are available, but they are in English. We have, uh, I mean, like the open source uh, journals, a lot of resources, a lot of databases. You can, you are really rich within your office. But there are two main issues. One, I mean, um, uh, the, the people who are doing research in Arabic, they are totally be excluded. So I mean, very few. Even when you, whenever you do certain search, because the search en uh, engine they try to locate the pages which are most common, I mean, uh, most common or something like that, so they go to the forum, and they were just, uh, I mean, uh, it's not that uh, scientific discussions within the forum, and uh, the, uh, the Arabic appearance and the content of the Arabic uh, within the web sphere, it's uh, almost. I can say none, <laughs> very little actually. We agree with you completely. In fact, we're trying and, to. Uh, yeah. yeah, we the agree with you. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I don't know, for our region, uh, we cannot rely much on the net. Uh, suddenly, you will not have, I mean, for, because uh, we have certain providers for the network, and uh, suddenly the network is not available today, even though you are, I mean, you're supposed to be online uh, with, uh, attending uh, lectures, but suddenly the net is, and uh, uh, within the high level, they wasn't able to solve those small technical issues. And those issues really, so it make people that they're not really relying on the infrastructure and, uh, and the network. Uh, just to go to the point about uh, language. Fortunately or unfortunately, the language of science is English. Um, there is no two ways about it. If any scientist anywhere around the globe uh, going to discover something, I'm talking science now, not humanities or culture or something else, um, he will discover something, he will publish it in nature, science, or one of these journals. And there was an excellent article in The Lancet um, some 10 years ago uh, from a French scientist lamenting uh, the lack of use of French in scientific uh, world, but admitting freely that the language of science is now English and not French, Arabic, or any other language. Um, is this good or bad? I don't know. But uh, it is a fact of life. And um, I see it in Egypt. Uh, I see some of the nurses and the doctors around in the hospitals around us uh, say, um, We can't communicate with you. You're always talking in English. I say, I'm not talking in English because I love English. Absolutely not. I, lo I love Arabic and it's my mother tongue. But my God, all the literature of on uh, science, have you, so I asked them, I asked the nurses, I asked the doctors, have you read a journal? Do you know what trials have been published in the last 15 years? Oh, they get translated eventually but you want to apply it to your patient tomorrow. I mean now. Please, I mean you can't, go, you have to communicate with your colleague. And we heard that uh, science and collaboration is global. And again, by sheer number or whatever else, English has to be the, uh, the means of communicating in science. Mm -hmm. I'm sticking to science now. Um, so we have to admit that. That's right. Is it defeat? I'm not sure. That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, if you can uh, talk about, so, okay. So, so another problem altogether. Suppose that we are successful in making these collaborations take off. 
Another problem that we have is sustaining these collaborations. So we see a lot of these things. Like now we've started here this Arab expat scientists database. We have about 5,000 scientists on it, and we're planning to invite them all and engage them. But how do we sustain these things? They're not sort of just like a, a novelty. You know, we do it today because it's a political, right, the political right thing to do, and then tomorrow go off to something else. So this would be the last question, then we want to open it for discussion. Uh, 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 Dr. Ahmed, if you can talk about how do you sustain these things and how do we make them uh, um, uh, long term? Okay. Uh, organi actually, individual uh, collaboration or, uh, is usually do not last for long, usually. But if we, uh, we concentrate in organizational uh, collaboration, or partnership. The organization is our, uh, between, uh, uh, collaboration between, or partnership between two organizations, it lasts long. This is one of the, uh, I just I put my notes there, uh, this is one of the recommendation to have sustaining a partnership. Second is having a bright people around the table. I mean, usually, <laughs> I, 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 usually I, I, I tell you the truth, uh, in GCC, especially in GCC, we sometimes, in some, in some university, we lack the bright scientists. And this is major, actually a major problem. And there is no, actually, no enforcement from the policy or from the regulation of that university or institute to improve themselves. And th this is a major problem. Also, to have a champions, champions uh, and leadership these champions can uh, stay with the partnership through the high and low points and promote partnership and also facilitate among members and serves as, as spokespersons. The presence of champion from the multiple sector, for example, the community, university, health, and so on, will enhance the feasibility and value of the partnership. Also, building a new relationship not just stay with, uh, where you are now. You have to seek for new relationship. For example, I, today I just met many people here, and actually I was, uh, I'm really proud to, to know them, and hopefully to keep uh, collaboration with them in the future, but um, for uh, for long time. Also, we should engage uh, senior leaders. Actually, in GCC. I have so many points, but I cannot have them, all of them, <laughs> but I will show them. See, uh, usually in GCC, a lot, there's a lot of politics and uh, regulations. It's not easy to do research <coughs> or collaboration. So by informing senior leaders and to give you the green lights for, uh, for sort of freedom in terms of, of, term of uh, collaboration, it will be it will easy. Uh, is the sustained, uh, sustained uh, partnership. Also, we have to develop mechanism to provide ongoing funding. Do not rely on the government funding. Also, we have to have our own source. Because in, for, if you look to the Qatar Foundation, for example, main funding come from government, if I'm, is that true? Uh, yeah, so we have to have uh, our own resources. This is when in Europe, for example, uh, uh, the resources come from private companies. They support research. In GCC, very hard to find private companies to support research. So if we have our own infrastructure and investment in research you know, for that type of organization, we can keep it sustained. Also, uh, I have mentioned that, but increase the number of research centers. I'll tell you an example, for example, we in, in SKU, in Sultan Qaboos University in, in Oman, for example, when we established that university, that university was only for teaching, not for research. After many years, they start, people start just encouraging research. And we could do that one from the first year of the establishment of that, SQ, of that university. No, but no, they have waited for a long time just to introduce research and fund research. And this, is, this point is mentioned by Sir Magdi about the 
research uh, again the, in, the, in the university. Also, we, we should encourage the meeting and conferences in like GCC. So how, for example, if you look to the, how, if, for example, people work with diabetes, do the people know each other in GCC? I bet if you, <laughs> they, I, I can say, most of them, they don't know each other. Or they, they are very close. Why? Because there's no meetings, there's no conferences. They don't meet each other. I, I work in immunologist, uh, as I was immunologist before in SKU. But uh, I don't know many immunologists in GCC because I never met them. I met, uh, I went to conferences in Europe and I met one or two. But where's the rest? Where's the immunologist in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Qatar, and this? That's because of the lack of the meeting and conferences. We should, we should encourage this point as well. well thank you. So I, um, so I agree with most of your points, except, uh, I'm sorry, Samir, please go ahead. Uh, sorry, just to support my colleague here, um, that sustainability, like you say, is an absolutely essential thing. And um, at the beginning, it could, the wheels can be oiled by collaborative grants, collaborative funding. But from then on, it has to be built on win-win principle that the scientists themselves believe in the collaboration and like you have said, see that there is a benefit, not to one side, but to both sides. And then it emanates from them and they want to carry on with it. It needs to be pushed at the beginning, but then it becomes self-sustainable, mm -hmm. hopefully. Yeah. So I was gonna say that I agree with, with all the things that you said except one thing. I don't believe that very little in life happens top down. I believe in things usually happen from the bottom up. So I think sustainable collaborations happen between two points, X and Y, and not between two organizations. Um, th this is where I would differ with you. Um, I'm new to the Gulf area, so I don't know if there are enough regional conferences or not. It seems that there's too many from all the ads that we receive, but, but, but I, I, I don't know that point. But in fact, I know that if a collaboration starts between the Qatar Foundation and KAUST, that the, despite all the will, all the great will that, that found the, the foundation has in starting a collaboration with KAUST, in all honesty, and I get myself in trouble sometimes for just saying what I, you know, it, it's not happening, it's just not happening. Whereas a collaboration between one of our researchers and some, you know, and somebody else, if they really wanted to collaborate, that's the easiest way to, to, to get things going. So without any further ado, I don't want you to cheat by looking at these questions. These are really bad questions, all prepared by Murad. <laughs> So I want you to ask your questions, and do we have enough? Uh, um, first, introduce yourself, and then ask your question. I'm uh, Mohamed Boujdir from uh, New York. Uh, I'd like to make an observation and a related uh, uh, proposition, since we're talking about challenges and opportunities in, in the partnership, not only in the Middle East, but also in North Africa, otherwise known as MENA. Uh, on Sunday, uh, we visited some of the finest institutions here in Doha, uh, which are, you know, the Cornell Medical Schools, Texas A&M, and Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I can tell you that the general impression is that uh, this is one of the strength of the strategic planning of the Qatar Foundation. Uh, however, the observation was that uh, the ratio of uh, student to faculty was almost uh, two to one. So there is significant opportunities here. Now, this is my comment. The related observation in terms of partnership has to do with the fact that if Qatar Foundation really wants to develop a very strong research program, you need to have a critical mass of students and grad students, essentially. And given the fact that 
as has been mentioned earlier, there are resources here, as I mentioned, in these three institutions. Uh, one path, possible uh, solution to having this critical mass is to open the entrance to these institutions from countries who have this uh, human resources, such as Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt, and, and have them come here, study in these institutions, and eventually retain them to be the uh, uh, grad students who will eventually empower uh, research with the faculty and also uh, help in the recruitment process that I know you guys are, 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 are trying to achieve. And I'd like to know what the panel uh, thinks about this proposal. So we, we, as far as the computing, we're doing slightly better than that. So we're bringing the students from all those places, and we're not forcing them to stay here. Um, in fact, we, we bring students from Egypt and, and Morocco and Algeria and, and so on, and we give them a training place, and then we send them off to get an advanced degree. And if they decide to come back, we'd be very grateful. And if they decide to go somewhere else, we understand that eventually they'll come back, like the rest of us. So, so but, but you're absolutely right. Um, so how are we going to do this? I'll have to stand up. And uh, um, Iris, go ahead. I, uh, since you're my friend, I'll full rank. stand so I can see you. Um, I just want to make a comment oh, first. Oh, Aris, one thing. Please keep the comments to 30 seconds. Okay. And, and then so give you, you give an opportunity to the panelists right. to say okay. something. Uh, I'm Mary Supsell. I'm from University of Illinois. Um, I have a comment. Imagine what Al Jazeera is doing in politics in, in this whole region. When Imagine also an Al Jazeera for science, because it seems to me there is a lack of awareness and communication of what is happening around the Arab world, around the Islamic world, and so on. So if there is some kind of Al Jazeera of science, and looking and investigating the projects that might be happening around the region, and then highlighting them in all the, the countries. What do you think about this proposition? Raise your hand if you want to answer it or just... Yeah. I think it's and, great... And keep, it, and keep it short. Yeah. I think it is a great idea because we'll move a little bit away from politics to concentrate on science. And uh, they already have, I think, a program called Nujum al uh, They try to get innovative uh, individuals across Middle East and they give them all the tools that they needed to innovate. And they broadcast it in different channels. And it's really a very successful program. So they can just expand on that one. And I really, with you, I recommend that type of channel. So Iris, I think there isn't much going on in the Arab world. That's why uh, there isn't much attention to it. Uh, the lady in the back. I mean, there isn't much going on in science and, 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 and engineering. I didn't mean, there's a lot of politics going on. Going back. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Um, uh, Dr. Asma al Khatib, I'm a PhD student um, from uh, uh, Melbourne University in Australia, but I'm Qatari. So, my question or my comment what, what's the place for uh, scientific associations and societies? in strengthening the uh, researchers' um, connections and improve the commu uh, communication of research. Um, I've been in Australia for six years, and they have really strong um, uh, place for associations and societies, scientific-wise. Uh, that improves really um, the connection of researchers, and I feel like now, after six years, I know every researcher in the Southern Hemisphere, that because they have uh, annual uh, uh, meetings and uh, other connections. So do you think that if we can push for such societies and associations in each discipline and uh, try to organize regular annual or biannual or um, at any manner uh, um, 
meetings that would help in, uh, in the communication of the research and strengthening the relationship uh, between researchers in the region. Thank you. Dr. Zak. Uh, I think that's a very good question. In fact, in many countries in the developing world, it may already have started. Uh, scientific societies uh, and uh, academic bodies. Uh, and this is one aspect uh, that's missing in the Islamic countries or in the GCC country itself. Uh, if you look at the Royal Society that you mentioned earlier, it's 350 years old, right? And the U.S. National Academy of Sciences was founded by Abraham Lincoln. And that is your society is, what, 200 years old? The New York Academy of Sciences? That itself indicates something to us. Uh, we need to uh, promote that. Because uh, it's in the nature of Academy of Sciences to be scholarly, transparent, uh, apolitical, you know. These are the kind of elements that could prom promote the scholarship and eventually cutting edge R&D in these countries. So to answer your question, all those uh, are needed, I think, if you are going to promote uh, uh, better science and technology in our countries. Um, yes, you, you, you. you. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Majid Hihem from uh, Montreal in Canada, and I'd like to ask the panel what they think about the effect of grassroots um, research being done. And I mean by that, uh, try to do something early at the un undergraduate level. Let me give you two examples and ask my question. There's a formal system that works very well in Europe. It's called the Erasmus Exchange System for undergraduates, and it really reshaped how people from different universities within the European Union now function. There's an ad hoc system that has basically uh, existed between Algeria and Morocco that for historical reasons, Algerian MD students went to study in Morocco in the 90s. 10 years to 15 years later, which means now, there are more and more exchanges and regional conferences, patient referrals, and so on and so forth, but that's ad hoc. Do you think a formal uh, undergrad exchange system between GCC uh, University or you know, Islamic countries and university could do something? Any, any, go, go ahead, Dr. Actually, yeah, this, this is a very good idea. Actually, in Oman, for example, we have implemented this uh, type of exchange. For, and also, there is uh, optional, optional models in the, in the, for medical school. That's, uh, they have about two or three credit hours only to do uh, research, either in Oman or outside. Also, if we're here in Oman, for example, sending some student abroad to do some research as well. Ab abroad or to another GCC country? No, actually, we, we send them uh, abroad. That means GCC ah. and outside as well. Outside as well. Uh, excellent idea. Apart from exchange between different countries, uh, I think um, teaching research in undergraduate years uh, is essential, and now that is part of uh, medical education uh, in several universities around the UK, for example, uh, one year BSc, um, or sometimes um, a research project in a different country, sometimes developing country, uh, and indeed uh, we have exchange between different universities. Currently at Imperial, in my department, is an undergraduate from Cambridge doing a PhD before graduating to become a doctor. So that is, he just, Cambridge realized that he is a, a bright student from Egyptian origin, as it happened, and uh, allowed him to go to another university in the UK, in this case, Imperial College, to do a PhD. He's having a great time. So can the I, idea is good. Can, I, I, you guys are too, too nice, too agreeable. Let me tell you my position. 
let me personalize it. So if uh, my nephew who's in Libya tells me I want to go and do an internship in Morocco or Tunisia, I'd say, forget it. Don't do it. I mean, it, it, I mean the institutions that he's talking, he's talking about Imperial and Cambridge. He's talking about two institutions with a lot of heritage in doing research, right? I mean, we're not here just to say nice things. We, we really we want to come out of this hour with something concrete. I mean, I think, less فَقَدْ الشَّيْءَ لَا يُعْطِيهِ if the you know, in Arabic, this means if you don't have it, you can't give it. So if, if, if two organizations want to collaborate and neither one of them knows the meaning of research, then what's the point of collaboration? And this is not just, I'm not just saying that to be, let's look at the number of papers. Let's look at the number of papers, the number of citations, the number of patents, and, and, and that would give me an indication of quality. So what we need to do is raise, raise the quality and, and collaborate. Uh, 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 Ellis, yeah, please go ahead. You need a microphone. Yeah. Turn it on. Pushing for a big solution for a problem that's really difficult, and it was I, I tried to address it in my, I think we were allowed 30 seconds in the opening session, uh, which is to create a scale. And I don't think it's honestly true. That I think you're overly negative about what exists in the Islamic world. I'm not going to speak for an individual university or country, but you know that you have some centers of excellence in Turkey and Pakistan and there, even in Egypt, there are some areas that in places like Alexandria University has some parts. Undergraduate, pro excellent yeah, well, undergraduate okay. programs. So, but the thing is, nobody knows who these people are. There's no way to link them to anything. So they can't scale to get any help, and they can't be brought out into the real world. There's no opportunity to mentor them or do anything. And every comment practically here is a piece of an ecosystem that exists in the West. In the West, you have societies, you have science publications, you have news, you have informal ways for people to interact, and you don't have any of that here. So I had already been asked to suggest that uh, somebody create an Islamic World STI initiative. And the idea of that would be it doesn't cost a lot of money. <clears throat> you have, it's not true you don't have academies. Well, it is true you don't have academies, but you have the Arab Science Technology Foundation, you have ICESCO, you have OIC, Comstec, none of which do much of any of the things that you just mentioned. But why don't they? Because nobody gives them any money, and nobody actually encourages them to do the things that would really make a big difference. So to me, the honest thing would be to get together and actually create a strategic plan that looks at the ecosystem and says, I'd like an Al Jazeera of science, and you have Bloomsbury Press, and you can tell them, stop doing these journals that are useless, do the Al Jazeera of science, or you could go to Al Jazeera and do it. And you could say, I want to have a society or an academy that actually holds events around the world in different key areas where we have some strengths or we have really big challenges like obesity and diabetes. So give some money to the ASTF or the OI or the ICESCO and say you're only allowed to do events in these key areas and if you take this money. And you can do a whole series of things, and if you would identify at the bottom the actually exciting young researchers in different areas in all these countries, you'd have scale, and that would be interesting to the companies uh, that are around the world. It would be interesting to the other universities to make alliances. At least that's my idea. Uh, uh, let's hear uh, an answer from this side. Uh, I, I think Dr. Mejdi, Dr. Zakri, Ahmed, anybody wants to say anything, or should we move on? I think this is an uh, excellent idea. Uh, Ellis is just showing the way and telling us Muslim how to operate. And it's uh, fairly cheap, really, because uh, we are drawing on available strength in the region, right, in the Islamic world. And uh, there are compelling uh, issues that we can address at the outset. One of that, he just mentioned, obesity and diabetes. You know, it's a very real thing. Uh, I would say these are the grand challenges, really, and uh, it's not an exhaustive uh, team. There might be many more. But it's, it's, it's really 
implementable if only there would be some leadership, some uh, understanding from the political high up to back this kind of proposal. Um, I, just to comment very quickly on having regional and local and global and why don't we go global and open it up? I mean, the, the means of communications are, have, has never been easier. And we want uh, the whole, the title of this uh, meeting is globalization of science and not localization of science. So it, uh, it behoves us to say, come everybody, if you want to go anywhere in the world, uh, so long as you are serious and you want to collaborate with your neighbor or wherever you want to go, globalization. Mm -hmm. So we're um, a few minutes uh, uh, um, over time. I'm standing between you and your coffee break. Somebody has a really, really something that's got to be said, or otherwise. Uh, uh, Esma. Yes. We have 20 more minutes? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm off of schedule. This goes on till 4? Wow. <laughs> your, your, your captain is taking you <laughs> wrong way. Okay, then ask away. Ask away. So, do I have 30 seconds? No, no, you have as much time as you want. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't take that much. I just want to... Yo, okay, I'm uh, Esma Aima. I'm a professor at the University of Montreal, Canada. Yes. And yes. I'm Algerian from uh, Algeria. So I, I do have a... Uh, um, I think it's important to say that when we want to collaborate, we need to have confidence. We need to trust the others, right? And if we want to trust the other, I guess we need some uh, legal issues to be sorted out. Because, uh, for example, to protect the intellectual property, for example, to protect the data that are exchanged, to have some, uh, you know, I think uh, these problems are sometimes totally ignored by the Islamic countries. They speak about infrastructure, they speak about so many things, but it's very um, rare when I hear about like legal issues. Because this is really important. It's at the strategic level, but it should be raised, right? So I don't know what are your comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, can I answer? Of course, of course, yeah. of course. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. Intellectual property and uh, trusting and uh, making sure that your invention will remain uh, within your university. And so, but it is exaggerated. I'm honestly sick and tired of intellectual property, uh, IP, because the, the, it, there is nothing more, and you said it at the beginning, there's nothing better uh, than trusting uh, your colleagues and publishing everything you discover and discussing everything. And uh, I have a motto in the things, um, saying to the researchers, think of what you could have discovered, you discovered if you collaborated with your colleagues, rather than we had researchers, honestly, who didn't want to talk to anybody, was hiding everything, and it just was counterproductive. So you're absolutely right, we have to trust each other, but uh, we sometimes exaggerate it and say, IP, don't talk to me before signing a, a document. <laughs> so, um, yes, go ahead. So, hi, I'm Mona Cassini, I'm from the University of Bolzano in Italy. Uh, so, um, I think that research institutes in the Arabic and the Islamic uh, world. Um, they tend to collaborate more with top places to gain visibility because they are developing. So, um, 
So what if, uh, or how realistic it is to move from the one-to-one -one collaboration scheme to, um, and imitate the uh, European uh, projects that maybe involve like different um, Arab countries or Islamic countries and uh, universities from the West. So we can all learn at the same time how to do research and this could maybe increase the, the um, amount of collaboration among Arab countries and Islamic countries. Okay, so the idea is how about uh, uh, um, sponsoring or starting larger collaborations like the, uh, the uh, uh, framework projects in Europe. I, I, I think a lot of good things came out of the framework projects. I am not such a fan of all the management that goes with it. There's so much overhead that goes with it. But you know, like everything has got some positives and negatives. So I'm, I was at the University of Padova, so I'm, anybody has, uh, so s s instead of sponsoring smaller one to um, one uh, PI type of things, how about sponsoring larger collaborations? Uh, can I, uh, I think that comes later uh, with um, the growth of the research institutions and then you know uh, that there is a whole lot of uh, expertise in Paris uh, in development of biology. So we have, and there's expertise in the UK with something else. And we, we are part, for example, I know about that because we are a part of consortium uh, HP7, as you say, to do with cardio cell. So cells for stem cell research and regeneration. But then you need to find very, very mature groups in different parts. It doesn't work early on. Uh, early on, people should find uh, the win-win situation person to person and it should not uh, be a marriage, uh, arranged marriage. It should be uh, really they believe in each other and they want to collaborate. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, are there any large scale collaborations like say a project that has 30, 40 PIs and, and, and so many students and so on anywhere that you know of in this area? Okay, he can, uh, the medical as, as far as I know, there is no big, big yeah. collaboration or big uh, or large group collaboration in, in Oman. I talk about Oman. But there's a collaboration, individual collaborations. So, I mean, what she mentioned, actually, she's, it's a very good idea to, I mean, to practice this type of uh, collaboration. Also, uh, we have a collaboration, for example, as an organization or uh, organization collaboration between uh, um, uh, Sultan Qaboos University in Oman and Al Ain University or United Arab Emirates University. Although there is uh, organization collaboration, but still the, is the movement or the progress is very limited. So I'm going to go with the reverse uh, age order. I'm going to start with this young lady. Uh, hi, my name is Dania. I'm from Carnegie Mellon University in QF, Qatar Foundation in Qatar. And my question is, uh, I'm in my fourth year of computer science. And I'm really interested in pursuing uh, like projects to work on in the region, but I'm not aware of any. And um, as, as for the West, we read many papers, we have publications, uh, we are aware of many conferences, and I can get in touch with those professors. Even if my professors were not aware of, the, of people working in areas I'm interested in, I can suggest to them because I have read things and I know, I know about the area through publications. I don't see anything of the sort in the Arab world. Um, even even uh, talking about uh, like universities in Qatar itself, Qatar University, which is outside QF, we're not aware of what professors are doing over there. So as students, there's little that we know about what's happening. It's only, uh, uh, it's only through our professors that we come to know about uh, the outside world. So I think if, I don't, if there's a repository or something that says what, what each university works on and what it, what it has to offer to students, so people like me who are interested in doing PhDs can consider th those universities. 
And also for me, as a, uh, there's uh, another problem, the credibility. So if I'm given a choice of pursuing PhD in, as a Carnegie Mellon student to go to Egypt, for example, or to go somewhere in the US, well, I would go to, US, to the US because um, there is no scale on which we compare uh, Arab universities. Probably if they're not comparable to the West, we could have something which is regional, saying that those universities are the top ones in the Arab regions, but there's nothing uh, of the sort as of now. So. I, I'm really sorry, but I mean these universities, if they are not publishing, they are no good. So it's it's, it's simple. It's their, it's it's simple. their fault. You have to correct the universities. You don't need to go looking for them. Um, if they are centers of excellence, you would have heard about them. Then, because it is their duty uh, to publish not just publish for the sake of publication, because they are a center of excellence. So if they are hidden somewhere and not publishing, don't go to them. Also bub publishing high quality paper. So, so uh, Dania, you come and uh, talk to us. Uh, there are about um, 35 or 40 people. Uh, at QCRI, and we have plenty of problems for you to work on. Yeah, I, I definitely, I, 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 I know you've out. come and visited, so yeah, I, I just want to point out that there are people working, but for example, I'm doing an undergrad project, and I've read about 30 papers by now. None of them come from the Arab world, and they're from big conferences uh, in wireless networking, and I haven't seen any, any university so far uh, in the Arab region. I know there are people working on, uh, on those projects, but I cannot, I cannot see universities being cited, and that gives me a little confidence in those institutions as to the resources they can offer uh, me as a student, and that's my, my main I agree. point. I agree. I think you're right. That's what I was trying to say, and I was told to be, I, I was negative. I agree with you. Okay. Um, um, so wait a minute, uh, Salim, wait. I think uh, second and third. Okay, no, you asked a lot of questions already. Back there. <laughs> uh, go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Actually, uh, thank you very much for the excellent topic that you're raising today for uh, for a regional approach of the research, something that we have been doing on, uh, I'm Elham Fawzi from uh, Queen Medical Research Office and affiliated with uh, Cairo University and associate professor in Cairo University um, School of Dentistry. Uh, actually, I find it a very interesting topic because what's happening in this part of the world, and I don't want to just call it or name it Islamic uh, countries, because Egypt, for example, we have a population who are not <laughs> Muslim, so uh, I would recommend mentioning the Arab world or Middle East or something because it has been repeated since the beginning of the. I actually go for uh, <laughs> global glo uh, global world. So, um, okay. This is this is one comment here. The other part is that uh, um, we actually have a triad to perform appropriate research work. Uh, we need uh, um, human capital. We need funds. We need uh, infrastructure. And these three things are not available um, almost anywhere in the world in the same place, except in very few places. And uh, even in the Western world, uh, some of the people who are performing the work are from other parts of the world and even from Middle Eastern region. So uh, I would um, uh, emphasize the issue of um, combining the, this triad, like the human capital, the uh, funds, and the uh, infrastructure, a model that we have done here in Qatar by uh, collaborating with um, Cairo University, for example, Qatar University and the West, to have the experience and the um, transfer the, 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 the knowledge, and at the same time, the human capital that is uh, not properly used in Egypt, for example, they have a lot of publications, a lot of experience, they can perform a lot of work, but um, as Dr. Sir Magdi has been mentioning, they are not publishing in the correct uh, routes. They are publishing through local journals, uh, which are not peer-reviewed, and this is one of the major, major drawbacks that is happening there. And I think this needs as well part of our support. Like, if we can provide 
uh, certain um, ways for them to uh, get these publications to the international level. This will also help globalization of research because a lot of very important researchers are just over the shelf and uh, have been put in uh, local journals uh, that might also come up with uh, a lot of uh, important uh, ideas later on. So uh, I think this is uh, something that we need to know. Thank you. Uh, no comments in the back? Yes. Uh, yes, my name is uh, <coughs> Mohammed Bel Khiyat. I am, uh, my background is in energy and power systems. I come from the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, I just want to make a comment first, which is uh, Qatar has accomplished so much in such a short period of time, given its limited resources in terms of human resources and land mass. Um, but I would like to hear the panel's opinion on something that is, in my opinion, extremely important in the, in the field of research and technology, and that is ownership. I have not uh, heard much uh, talk ownership. about ownership. And that is, <clears throat> in order to create uh, or to develop anything, uh, whoever is doing that has to have a sense of ownership. That's how things work. Uh, in a lot of endeavors that are successful. And with that, I want to hear about tenure. When we're talking about professors at universities, how do uh, professors feel secure with their positions, uh, either in teaching or developing or uh, doing research? Uh, are universities in Qatar offering tenure? And if not, uh, why not? Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, I want to hear also about citizenship, and this is not particular to Qatar. I mean, throughout the uh, Arab world, it's extremely difficult to get uh, citizenship. If a scientist or a scholar does not feel that he's going to end up uh, uh, owning a piece of, of that country, so to speak, then he's a transient. I, I want to hear an honest discussion of this topic. And thank you very much. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I didn't understand ownership when you started, but, um, um, and I thought you were talking about IP, which I hated in the first place. But, uh, but now I understand that you're talking about uh, retention and um, giving them dignity and tenure. Uh, Am I right? I mean, then they feel that they are part of the system rather than ownership. What is ownership? I think, I think IP is part of it, and I don't agree with your previous comment regarding <laughs> IP. I think, I think you're uh, grossly misjudging uh, IP. IP is, is, in fact, an extremely important element of ownership. I, I, well, let me just continue, please. I'm not uh, stopping through, Throughout the Arab world, the Arab world, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Algeria, we have fraudulent software running like, like wildfire. And that hampers innovation. If anyone in North Africa is able to copy software that costs millions of dollars throughout the Western world without paying anything, how is innovation going to thrive? And I'll tell you, the reason for that is, not, is that IP is not enforced. And that is tied uh, to the idea of uh, ownership. We don't feel a sense of ownership. And, and that, in turn, is tied to citizenship. So let us be frank with each other. I think, I mean, you're mixing two things with respect. To, uh, forgive me. Um, IP, you're right. There has to be IP. But what I was saying, I didn't say uh, you shouldn't have IP. I'm sorry if I give that impression, but I'm saying it is exaggerated. And if you mean ownership, like my researcher who was hiding everything from everybody and writing to editors behind my back saying, uh, so and so stole my idea. Well, he never stole her idea because ideas come when they mature. So that type of ownership is, is really harmful. Uh, but um, so there should be IP, uh, there should be intellectual freedom, and sh there should be collaboration. 
And uh, when we have a seminar, I tell everything I know. And anybody who wants to run with it, great. And that's the way of doing things. And um, when the Human Genome Project was going on, um, some of the scientists in London were, were putting everything, the sequence on the internet the following day and saying this belongs to mankind, where there were other scientists who believed in ownership and were trying to patent bits of uh, RNA. And guess who got the Nobel Prize? But uh, it's not an issue, the Nobel Prize, but I mean, science, you can argue ma many ways. It needs to progress, but it does belong to humanity. I hate and to humanity. interrupt you, but IP is just an element of my question. The next one is citizenship, please, please. But citizenship, I said to you that that dignity, tenure, and retention. So if you are a brilliant scientist, uh, no, um, dean in his right mind will ever threaten you. He will give you dignity. Um, he must give you citizenship, as you say, if you so require. So you have to value science on its own right. And to my way of thinking, I think the word dignity comes into it a lot more. That you, you just it's not treated as dare I say, a bloody foreigner, uh, but part of the system because you are a scientist. You are who you are, a scientist. And that is, I mean, it comes into uh, what my colleague here was saying in the academies, the Royal Society. Um, if you are a scientist, you have the highest dignity and nothing, I mean, we don't think who you are, where you come from or whatever. Because science and what you have done is valued. Is that what you're saying, or am I just misjudging you again? <laughs> so, so to to, to no, just I, uh, I agree. To, uh, Thank just you. just a second. So, so to, to stop the going back and forth. So just a quick, very very quick point. I think there are two extremes in the air world. There are countries that offer everybody that walks the door tenure, and and the system doesn't work. Um, everybody that walks through the door, like, like say, for example, I don't know the system in Tunisia, if you're from Tunisia, like say in Libya and so on, once you're hired, you've got a permanent position for life and, and it just doesn't work. And there are some countries, like in the Gulf, where everybody is a contractor and there's no tenure system. And also that does not work. Does not, yeah, these are the, the two extremes. But, you know, so a tenure system like what exists in the U.S., uh, that's based on, 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 on merit and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I, I don't know where it, where, where it exists right now in, in, in the Arab world. In terms of your question about citizenship, I'm just trying to, to keep quiet because I want to give a chance. So um, uh, when we first came, and, and, and he's smiling here, when we first came in Qatar in 2005, and since then we've been coming very often, this was the very first thing that we talked about with Her Highness. The fact is, if you want scientists to stay here and to contribute in a long, long-term fashion, you have to somehow devise a pathway to, I don't know, you call it ownership, I don't want to call it citizenship, but something where people feel like they belong. So I, it's like the system that we have, we have in the US, you come in, you develop residence, from a residence you become a citizen, there's a clear path, you know. So it has to be customized to this, to, to this region because there are other considerations. But in fact, um, I believe, like I think you believe, that the variety, the heterogeneity creates value. It's not the homogeneity. So um, I come to you right after, otherwise she's gonna throw her shoes at me. And I know how she will do it. It is over time now? Oh, yeah. okay. We're over time? Okay, so I'll make it very, very quick, actually. Um, my name is Mona Diab. I'm from Columbia University in New York, and I'm Egyptian. Um, I just wanted to speak to the notion of capacity building 
that I think is very relevant in this context, especially in the region. And I was wondering if something could be institutionalized on the level of across the region, where um, I'm a firm believer in the scientific thinking and scientific method, and I think that's something that's really missing, like it's a missing gap in our, um, it's a gap in our, in our educational systems. And um, you had mentioned, uh, Sir Magdi, you mentioned something about um, uh, having this in the undergraduate level now in, in the UK institutions. In the US, it's part of the liberal arts education. In the Arab world, unfortunately, we don't have that. And one of the things that I came across yesterday in one of the booths was North Atlantic University, where they have this postgraduate research assistant training program, where they teach people how to do research methods, scientific reading. The problem that I face when I get students from the Arab world, they sometimes have excellent, excellent um, potential. But you give them papers to read, they read so many papers, they still don't get anything out of it because they were not trained in the scientific method. So one thing that I would like to suggest Actually, two things. The first thing would be something along the lines where you have compressed programs of uh, research methods and scientific method training for like maybe five or six weeks to these students who come from these, from Cairo University, from Morocco, from Syria, from, from the whole entire region. And you get them trained in that in a concentrated fashion. That's one thing. The second thing, a culture of mentorship where um, this is something that I have not seen here in the Arab world at all, but we do have it in the US, so I'm a part of an institution. I came in, a, I came in as junior faculty, and I had the senior faculty mentor, mentor me. And you have that process embedded in the system, and I was wondering to what extent that could be impl implemented in, uh, in, in this framework across the region. Actually, uh, we have in Oman, for example, uh, one of the criteria uh, to, for your proposal to be accepted is the research capacity. So the research capacity on, uh, on our uh, focus. So, and, uh, and there is uh, so many programs, PhD programs, master programs, and even training, sh short courses programs are developing in, in, in general in GCC. So there are, uh, there are some. What I was referring to was something on institutional level across the region where you bring in students or you go out, out to the students and you train. This is sort of like low-hanging fruit where you can actually build capacity very quickly um, that, that could feed into whatever research positions you're interested in, in addition to the mentorship angle. So, okay. Yeah, you are right. Uh, still, I mean, even, uh, for example, in every year we send so many people outside for uh, postgraduate and for uh, even undergraduate students just to to, to build very strong uh, research capacity. So I, I want to thank you all. I want to thank Dr. Zekri, Dr. Sayyid Mejdi, Dr. Zahra, and Dr. Ahmed Khalifa. Thank you very, very much. This is a topic that we could go on and on and on. And the audience.